Mistakes and failures can be some of life's best teachers. When it comes to letting our kids fail, how do we know the difference between letting them fail and letting them drown? What do you do if your teenager hasn't mastered the skill of asking for help? Or what do you say when your teen doesn't even care? Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Lynn, I think this episode is super duper relevant as we start the new school year. And particularly in the context of some parents maybe hiring homework coaches or sort of stepping in and filling in the gaps where their kids are still struggling to perform academically. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say to parents as we start a new school year? I really want parents to know that this isn't about all or nothing so that we're supporting our kids, we're encouraging our kids, we're letting them fail. But there are certain circumstances with kids who have learning issues or other things like that. I don't want parents to think that they take the approach of, okay, so I'm totally hands off. I'm not going to do anything. If my kid is screwing up, I'm going to let them drown because then you're going to have another problem on your hands. So it's really about how you figure out when to step in and help and when you allow your kids to make mistakes and suffer consequences oftentimes in a way that's not going to be life altering, but is really going to give you an opportunity to teach them some important skills and lessons. So for parents of younger children who are in elementary school, what do you think is a really great best practice? When kids are learning something new, when they're coming up against a challenge, I want parents to be there to support, but I want you to allow your child to feel some distress and some discomfort as they're learning something new. I want you to support that they get help from their teachers so that you are not stepping in with homework to make sure that everything goes back to the teacher perfectly, because then the teacher doesn't really even know what's going on. But talking to your kids about the normalcy, the importance, the certainly difficulty in learning something new and not knowing how to do it at first and giving room for those uncomfortable feelings that you support, that you talk them through, but you don't jump right in and do it for them. Right. This episode is really unpacking that skill of differentiating when you step in and when you hold back, exactly. which I think is like, you know, we need a lot of practice with it as parents. Yeah. And it's a moving target. It's a flexible skill. It's a skill that's really important to develop early on because what happens as kids get older and the stakes get higher, parents are far less willing to develop that skill when you've got a junior in high school than when you've got a fourth grader or even a seventh grader. Hey, Lynn, we have a great listener question today because I think that it speaks to this ongoing challenge parents who even intellectually know that they need to give their kids the space to fail. They might know that, but how do you actually put that in practice and know how to do it always feels maybe a little uncomfortable or they might feel a little uncertain about that process. So I'm going to give you this new listener question. Okay, I'm ready. My 16-year-old daughter has been diagnosed with anxiety disorder and has some executive function challenges. She has an executive function coach helping her with school organization and homework management, and she has a therapist we're working with for anxiety and emotional support. She has a large term paper due this semester, and her teacher has already broken it down into manageable steps and due dates and made it clear she's available to help. I know that my daughter's not meeting the deadlines and is not asking any of us for help. And I'm not supposed to be checking her grade portal, but I have my own anxiety about this and I gave in. I think it is time to let her fail and experience the distress on her own. Is that fair or am I expecting too much from an anxious teen who's in denial? Yeah, so this is a question that I hear so much, you can imagine, because we know that anxiety is all about avoidance. And we know that one of the things when we're working with anxious kids and when I'm working with anxious families, it's that balance between when do you step in and help and when do you allow them to develop the skills. 
And how do you help them develop the skills? So here's the first thing that I was sort of struck with by this in terms of thinking of skills, right? This 16-year-old clearly has a very caring parent, right? She's got a very caring mom. She also has a teacher who is helping her break down the assignment. She also has an executive functioning coach, and she also has a therapist. And she's not asking anyone for help. So that's the first skill that I'd want to go after, right? How do you recognize when you need help and how do you ask for it? And we've talked about this before. This is such an important skill of being able to recognize where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses. So it's so important to recognize when you ask for help, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And avoidance when it comes to anxiety, right? Avoidance is the name of the game. So if anxiety is all about avoidance, I'm wondering how that pattern is being addressed. So once again, it comes down to, for me, stepping it up to sort of that meta level or stepping it up to that bigger approach is that when you have something that you need to accomplish or you have something that feels challenging or overwhelming or anxiety producing or whatever it's going to be, how do you get the help that you need and how do you develop those skills to push through the parts or to even recognize the parts that feel overwhelming. I think that there are conversations to be had. Here's what I'm curious about. I'm curious about what she's working on in therapy. I'm curious whether or not mom knows what she's working on in therapy. I'm curious about whether or not the executive function person is talking to the therapist and whether or not they've identified where the challenge comes from. Because if you've got a kid who's really anxious, and if there's some perfectionism there, and if there's some fear of what I have to step into, then oftentimes avoidance becomes the prominent thing that's going on, and it looks like she's disorganized, or she looks like she doesn't know how to do what she needs to do. So I'd really want there to be communication between the executive functioning coach and the anxiety person, because I feel like so often those two things are connected. And sometimes they both exist, sometimes one's stronger than the other. Sometimes the anxiety is really driving the train and really looking like executive functioning issues. For example, if you've got somebody who's really perfectionistic and they're not handing in their homework, everybody thinks that they've, they're disorganized. Well, they know where their homework is. It's just not perfect. So I really want to sort that out a little bit. The other thing is that letting kids fail and experiencing distress on her own. I am all for letting kids experience distress but I don't know that we have to put it in the context of on her own. That's not the way I'd look at it because she's already probably doing this on her own, right? She's (laughs) she's got all this help and she's not using it. So letting her fail on her own, and I'm making finger quotes, it ain't going so well so far. Here's what I keep thinking about when I read this question. Mm -hmm. You know how we don't know these families, Right. So Mm -hmm. we're each projecting what we think is our best guess of who we see in this. I keep seeing two very contrasting potential realities. And of course, it's probably neither and it's somewhere gray in the middle. Mm -hmm. But I could and you tell me your feedback on this. You see clients like the 16 year old a lot. So then you would know what the range is Mm -hmm. to your point of teacher, therapist, executive function coach and parent. Mm -hmm. Is she just checked out because no one's given her the room to feel invested or? That is such a good question. Is she the kind of kid who is like, oh, and this is what the executive coach said. And this is what my teacher said. And mom, this is what someone said. And I'm trying to do it all, but I can't. Right. Is she showing that she's liking this involvement and that she needs it? Is she verbalizing that this is the right thing for her? Or is she just like, you know what? Why should I even bother? Because everyone else is doing this. Yeah. That is a really good question. And you're right. We don't know this about this young woman. Does she feel like, you know what, go ahead. Everybody can step in and and do my job for me. Maybe she doesn't have any confidence in her ability to do things because if we've got an anxious mom that has been told not to check her grade portal, so that's a little sign also, right? So somebody told mom, like, you need to back off. And so this makes me think, Robin, such a good question. And again, I go after that language of letting her fail on her own, experiencing distress on her own. 
I think we can just modify that a little bit and figure out one question we really want to ask, what do you want and what do you feel like you're capable of doing and what do you think you need help with? That's what I would want to ask. Let's hear more of that after we come back from our break. Okay, so Robin, it's pretty normal for people to feel this like oncoming sense of fatigue, like, oh, here we go again, buckle up. Or I would say my summer has worn me out. I mean, mostly in a good way, but man, I'm looking forward to the normalcy of a school year routine. I could use a little energy. Okay. So I think we've probably got people in both camps, right? Like they're looking forward to school and they're also like, oh, here comes school. Okay. So how about a little bit of metabolic reds to help you with that fatigue, to get you going, to give you a little bit of a boost? It's an anti-aging nutraceutical that you drink. It's perfect for before or after exercise, and it even works great as a meal replacement. If you want to live longer, live healthier, get more energy throughout the day, I would suggest trying Metabolic Reds. I love this stuff. I tell you, I got a big mug of it right in front of me at this moment. I drink it before I go and work out. I drink it during the day. It keeps me hydrated. It keeps me energized. And it actually tastes delicious. It really does. It gives the energy jolt of coffee without that midday crash. It's got nine different natural blends. They're scientifically proven to boost energy and focus. These nutrients help the most important cells of your body adapt, grow, and stay healthy longer. It's 100% natural. It gives you that energy boost that you've been missing. So go to getreds.com slash fluster so that you can try Metabolic Reds for yourself. That's getreds.com slash fluster. And you'll also be able to unlock a special offer of a free Metabolic Greens with your purchase of Metabolic Reds. Just go to getreds.com slash fluster to start feeling great. Robin, I don't love going to the grocery store. Yeah, you really don't go to the grocery store very often. But this is why something like Thrive Market is a dream come true because I can shop for everything that I need from my house, have it delivered right to my door. And if I find a price that's lower somewhere else, Thrive Market will match it. I love that Thrive Market carefully vets every item they sell. So you can trust that if they sell it, it's probably the highest quality available of that particular item. And I love that you can filter out 90 plus values and lifestyles to find what works for you, especially if you have any food allergies in your household like we do. When you first go on the website, you answer all these questions about what you like and what you're looking for. And then you can shop by what you eat and what matters to you. So they've got over 5,000 food home and beauty products. They have plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, BIPOC owned brands. They have it all. One of the things that I recently purchased was a whole new line of natural cleaning supplies for our bathrooms. I love the natural cleaning supplies because I don't want to bring toxic chemicals into my house. And it's so great. The variety they have is so much better than what's available at my grocery store. When you join Thrive Market, you're joining a community of over 1 million members and sponsoring a family in need. And with their fast and free carbon neutral shipping, you're also bettering our planet. Join Thrive Market today and get $80 in free groceries. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks to get $80 in free groceries. That's thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, we're back. I wonder if how much conversation has happened with this 16-year-old who's at a point in her life where we want her to develop some autonomy. We want her to have some skin in the game, so to speak. That's a great question. Has she just checked out? Has she's like, oh my God, I, I, you know what? I don't, I don't care. Everybody's going to do it for me. I have to go from one person to the next. Clearly the mom has a history of being very involved in academics because like you pointed out, She knows she's not supposed to go into the grade portal and she broke her own rules or she broke rules Mm -hmm. that someone told the mom, maybe her therapist. Mm -hmm. 
Could the mom say that this daughter has actually developed autonomy and had skin in the game in a different part of her life? Or is having skin in the game a skill that the daughter has clearly not learned yet and is working on? So that's the other thing too, is that does the daughter have a hobby or some other project or something that is getting a different skill set that schoolwork isn't? Mm -hmm. If we go back to thinking about the skills that you want to develop, so asking for help, that's the first skill I'd want to go after. And then the second skill I'd want to go after is where does this young woman show autonomy, right? Where does this young woman follow through? Does this 16-year-old know what sequencing is? Does this 16-year-old in other areas of her life know how to move from beginning to middle to end? In the question, the teacher has already broken it down. They've given her due dates, right? She's got this paper due. She knows she has to have this broken down and this broken down. And if she's got executive functioning challenges, that's a skill that you learn. Are there other places? Is this an academic issue or is this an overall issue? What gets her invested? If you say, we need to let her fail on her own, right? We need to let her fail on her own. Letting kids fail on their own can be a really good experience for some kids, letting them fail, letting them not get what they want because they didn't put in the effort, et cetera. But for some kids, if she doesn't have these skills, if she is currently feeling as if she is a failure, if she's currently feeling in her life, she's not capable of getting things done or managing her own life, then letting her fail can be pretty detrimental. If you let her fail on her own, here's what has to happen. There has to be a direct conversation with her. I know I say this all the time, but do you know, parents, what the therapist is talking to your child about in terms of developing skills and goals and what are they working on? There needs to be a direct conversation and she needs to be asked, what are the things that she wants? What are the skills that she feels like she needs to develop? How are those skills being developed? And if you do let her fail, if she still says, if you talk to her directly and she says, I got this back off, I'm tired of everybody telling me what to do, she still says she wants to do it herself, then after she fails, then there needs to be some sort of post-game analysis of what didn't work and what needs to be learned. So at least the failure has some purpose. If you just let it happen, maybe that'll be the moment where she'll be like, oh gosh, there is a correlation between my learning these skills and me doing good in school. But if this is a constant or if this is a consistent pattern of her not being able to get out of her own way, she's just going to start feeling worse and worse and worse about herself. So when we let kids fail, when we let them experience distress, it has to be done with some purpose in mind because you may learn a lesson from failing, but we want to make sure you learn the right lesson because there's a lot of lessons that kids can learn from failing something and not all of them are good. How do you let failure be the right kind of teacher without letting your kids drown? If you let them fail, it really really has to do with how you talk to them about it, both before and after. So you can say to your child, look, we have put so many things in place, right? I'm trying to help you, your teacher, your executive functioning coach, your therapist. And for some reason, we're not getting where we think you should be getting right? Let's just take this term paper as an example. It's not happening. So I have, and the mom can say, I have two choices here. One is I can back off. Yeah. Like we've been telling you to do for five years, right? I can back off and I can let you handle this and we can see what happens or we can work on you getting the skills that you need. If you don't hand in this term paper, there's going to be some consequences And you may say, and I'm going to allow that to happen. And then we're going to have to figure out what we do from there. And even to say, I would say if this family was in my office, I would say, what will be the next step when she doesn't hand it in? What do you all plan to do? What's going to come next? Because when we let kids fail and then the tone of it is, see, I told you so. See, look, that's what I said. I knew that would happen. Yep. Knew you were going to get an F. I mean, I've heard parents say this. Now, when you want to apply to this school or that school, or you want to do this, you've dug yourself a hole. I heard one parent say, you know what? You cannot do this if you want. And I am just hearing the doors of your life slamming. (laughs) That's, That's not what you want to say. But if you say, look, 
there are things that you can learn from this. There are things that I'm going to learn from this as a parent. Let's talk about what there is to be learned. Now, maybe you have that conversation after the failure happens, but you want to let her know if you're going to go hands off, if you're going to let her fail this long-term project, you want to say ahead of time, I recognize what's happening. I love you. I want you to know this is really hard for me to allow this to happen. And if you do fail this project, then we're going to have to talk afterwards. You're going to have to talk with the people that are here to support you what we're going to do next because I'm not going to let you drown. I'll let you fail, but I'm not going to let you get so buried into a hole that you can't get out of. The thing we don't want to have happen when we let kids fail, we don't want them to get the message that A, you're incapable in a global way. You can't handle this. You made your own mess. Now you got to clean it up. And also that this is a pattern. This is who you are. We don't want them to take that on as their identity because then they get to that very, very unfortunate place of why bother? Nothing that I do matters. So it really is setting the tone of I'm going to let this happen, but I'm going to be here. And it's going to be really hard for me to let this happen. And I hope that we can learn something from this. You bring that up about the why bother, and that was also something that I was wondering about, because without more information from the mom, would the teacher say that the child is motivated to do well academically, or is it the teacher's perception that the daughter even wants to do well or even wants to pass? Is there a depressive filter on this as well? It sounds like what you're also saying, though, is that for the mom to ask, all of these people have a role, but Is everyone communicating as a team? And is the daughter an equal member of that team? And if everyone's sort of doing something with her solo, as opposed to everyone coordinating something, it's just not going to be as effective to help her. Correct. Let's use a metaphor. Let's take it out of the role of academics. What if you have an adult and they have a stroke? So now we've got physical therapy, we've got occupational therapy, we've got a neurologist involved. Maybe we've got somebody providing home health care and support. Maybe there are some dietary things that need support. We've also trying to support family members. And what if none of those people were talking to each other and nobody knew what else was going on? That wouldn't be optimal care. And I think even more importantly, you've got this person who's had a stroke. What if nobody is asking them what they are experiencing? You know, one of the things I talk about a lot with anxiety when I'm working with families with anxiety disorders is that if I, if I want this child to get invested in this in some way, they have to have a want to. And does this 16-year-old want to do what everybody is telling her to do? Or is she tired of the academic pressure? Or is, is this not her thing? You know, I remember a long time ago, I had this uh, young woman who was coming to see me in high school, and she was a really, really, really good soccer player. And her older sister was a really, really good soccer player. So dad really was obsessed by all accounts, like it wasn't subtle, that he wanted his daughter to have a full ride to play soccer in college. And what started happening and what her what brought her to my door was that she started blowing things up. She started doing things that were absolutely going to get her kicked off the soccer team, that were going to piss off her coach. She started doing things academically that might even get her kicked out of the school that she was going to. Finally, she was able to say to me, my whole life is not soccer. My dad's whole life is my soccer. No one had really asked her whether she wanted to pursue his dream. Now, I'm not saying it's that extreme with this family at all, because completing a term paper is very different than committing your life 24-7 to getting a full-ride soccer scholarship at a D1 school. But I think my point is that helping this young woman articulate what it is that she wants, if she's saying to all these people, oh my gosh, I know, please, oh, I, I, I just, I don't know how to do this. It feels so overwhelming. I need some help dealing with my anxious thoughts or my executive functioning makes me so distracted. And so I need help. The, the interesting thing to me is that she is asking no one for help. And that either means she doesn't have the skill to ask for help or she is tired of this team and all of these people offering all of these suggestions and she's checking out. I don't know which one it is, but based on the fact that she's got an anxiety diagnosis, remember, avoidance is 
the absolute tool that anxiety uses to stay away from things that feel overwhelming. Did the mom create this team for her daughter to get an A on the term paper or for her to pass the term paper? I think that's a wonderful way that you put it, Robin. Is the 16-year-old a part of the team or is the six-year-old sort of an unwilling participant and perhaps an overwhelmed participant in this whole team? And are these people talking to each other? If she is really having trouble passing school, if she's really having trouble getting through then letting her fail on her own may not be the best strategy because she doesn't have the skill to do it. I think there really needs to be a conversation about where they are. I also am very aware of the fact that she's 16, and that is often a time in which parents start to panic about academic stuff, right? The dreaded junior year, you know, what college will you get into when you are destroying your future? When I'm talking to parents, I say, how many of you have talked to your teenager about junior year? And how many of you right now would see your junior year in high school as the pinnacle of your success or failure? Some of you maybe, but most of you, you look back at your junior year and you're like, yeah, you know, I was just trying to get through. So thinking about that, what are the external pressures? What are the external expectations? And then with anxiety, what are the internal pressures and what are the internal expectations? And are these two things communicating with each other? Because if there's anxiety, there's a lot of internal stuff going on and there may be a lot of external stuff going on too. Do you see or do you have any observations from other families that you actually know, right? Because, you know, we both admit this Mm -hmm. is a tough situation without having more information about this family to really know the context of this. But I feel like you did mention that there has been this trend of homework coaches and other types of Mm -hmm. support, parents who are very invested in academic outcomes and college success. Can you talk a little bit more about that as a separate issue? Yeah, I think that parents in, in terms of getting homework coaches, getting executive functioning coaches, getting SAT prep coaches, hiring people to help you come up with your college list, all of these things, it really is what kids feel when that happens is that their self-worth and their value is dependent upon grades. It's dependent upon college acceptances. It's dependent upon the scores that they get. And what parents tell me all the time, and I get it, they will say to me, you know what, this is what she wants and we're only doing this to support her. They might say that. Or they also might say, she doesn't know that this is what she needs, but we do. Because again, we don't want her to close the doors on her future. And we are really just working to create as many opportunities for her as possible. So that sounds good. But what the teenager experience is, is that I have to perform up to a certain level My parents have invested all this time and often a lot of money in creating this team around me. And now I have to succeed in this or else I have failed them. I have failed all these people, right? I mean, it's a very powerful message to give to a child that I am hiring all of these outside experts to make you better, if I had this family in my office, and again, we, we don't know the whole story, so we're sort of speculating with the information that we have, but I would just try and change the, t- the kind of conversations that they're having. One of the things that is really important to think about as a parent is that if you are having the same conversation over and over and over again, and if we were watching it, I say this to parents all the time, I'm going to imagine that we're videotaping the conversation is videotape an old language? I, I'm going <laughs> to, yeah, I know. we're going to get out a tape. Yeah. And then I'm going to put it in my Betamax. Yeah. And I'm going to try and splice it together and make a mixtape. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to record this conversation. And if I can stop the recording at a certain place and everybody can predict where it's going to go, right? What's going to happen? Oh, this is the place where we get where she storms out, or this is the place we get where she cries and says she's sorry, or this is the place where she says, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then doesn't do it. We need to recognize that having the same conversation over and over and over again is really just getting you the same result. How are you going to change up this conversation with her? 
How are you going to sit down? And instead of saying to her, it's so important that you do this and we're only trying to help you. And I know that your anxiety is getting in the way and you have to listen to what your executive function coach tells you. All of that stuff. How can you have a really different conversation with your teenager about this? How can you sit down and say, okay, so we've come to this place, haven't we? Where you've got this and this and this, and I've been told this, and you've been told this, and your therapist is saying this, and your executive functioning coach, we've had this conversation. And here's the question I've never asked you. I want you, mom, to think about what is the question that you've never asked your daughter? What's the question that will really change the tone of this, that will really change the outcome? Yeah. And I get it. Oh my gosh, I get it. But how do you have that question or how do you have that conversation where you ask a question that really says, what can we do differently instead of how can we keep doing the same thing and adding more people to the team and having more angry conversations and feeling more distressed and accumulating more failure and more disappointment? I don't want her to fail on her own. I really, when I saw that phrase, I I highlighted that in the question. I don't want her to fail on her own, but it does seem like she's going to fail with a team around her if she fails, and that's not a good thing either. How do we help her succeed in some way that is meaningful to her? Also, what is the success she wants? What is she invested in? You know, you might say to her, my goal here is to help you feel proud of something that you've been able to do. And whatever that may be, how can I help you get there? Or what am I not hearing? What am I not getting? I mean, to say to a teenager, what am I not understanding about this? And to say it very genuinely, there is something going on here that I'm not hearing and maybe you're not saying, but what do I need to hear from you? What do I need to listen to? Yeah, because something's not working. You can't, you have this whole team of people and something's not working. That's so great. I love that. I just want to repeat that for everyone. To lead with the question, what am I not understanding? What do I not know that I need to know so that it makes sense to me? Instead of accusing Mm -hmm. your child, you make no sense. I don't understand what you're doing. Right. That's not going to solicit the information to enlighten you more on the situation. So we'll be right back after this short break. I've had meal kits and they've been pretty expensive and the food hasn't been so great. But I will tell you, every plate is actually 25% cheaper than grocery shopping. And the meals that we made as a family, not only did they come together really quickly, not only were they simple and stress-free, but they were really delicious. They're ready in about 30 minutes or less. With food prices at the grocery store going up, I know that every plate is going to be a great value week after week. I love that we as a family sort of take turns who makes them because they're really that easy to follow. And you get to choose between 18 recipes that change each week. And what was great is that they didn't taste like my cooking. They tasted tasted like something different. Yeah, they tasted like something different. We had an incredible pork with mashed potatoes and carrots. There was this ginger chicken that I had. They have caramelized onion burgers. Get your first box for just one forty nine per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code FLUSTER149. Just get started with EveryPlate. Enter the code FLUSTER149. That's up to $110 in value. And it's delicious. Robin, we have heard over and over and over again how important it is that we take care of our mental health, but also how it can be tricky to find help when you need it. Our sponsor, Talkspace, is filling that need. It's really making it possible for busy parents, for busy people to get the help that they need when they need it. I mean, being able to reach out to a therapist or psychiatrist anytime from anywhere makes taking care of mental health so easy for busy parents. So wherever you are, knowing if you need to talk with your therapist, you can just send a message. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy 
therapy the same day as you sign up, which is so important that people have access when they most need it. You can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist. So it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. And instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24 seven. Talkspace has thousands of licensed therapists with years of experience in over 40 specialties, including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, anger management, relationship issues, food and eating, and so much more. I think one of the things that keeps people from reaching out and getting therapy is that they think about all the things that they have to make happen in order to fit in a therapy session. As a listener of Fluster Clucks, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. And make sure to use the code FLUSTER to get $100 off your first month. That's FLUSTER at Talkspace.com. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. If we're looking at task completion as the goal, so that seems wonderfully linear and wonderfully rational. If you would just meet the due dates and get the paper done, then everything would be fine, right? We want it to be that rational. We want it to be that linear. There's something else in there that needs to be talked about. There's a skill that needs to be developed. And let me just say this. When I say there's a skill that needs to be developed, that may not be a skill of breaking things down into parts. It may not be an executive functioning skill, although that is oftentimes a very helpful skill to have. It may be a more emotional management skill. I don't know this, but I'd really want to know what she's working on with her anxiety. I'd really like to know how that manifests itself and how that shows up. You can tell anxious people to do things all day long. And if they don't know how to manage their anxiety, they don't do them. It's that funny skit that was on Saturday Night Live a long time ago where the guy was like, just fix it. Just fix it. Right. You know, somebody's afraid of driving over a bridge and we're like, just drive over the bridge. Right. We just want them to do it. Are you confusing that with the skit? Take a look at yourself. I don't know that skit. It's like all these Saturday Night Live therapy <laughs> skits. Remember the one? I feel like it was Mike Myers, but now I'm not positive. Yeah. But no matter what the problem was, the answer, the solution was always take a look at yourself. <laughs> take a look at yourself. Take a look at yourself. <laughs> it was very coffee yeah. talk. That was what I thought you were talking yeah. about. I don't know the, the other, other one. The other one was a guy where I, I forget what I for, I don't I, I can't remember who it was, but it he was on he it was on Weekend Update, right? And he'd be doing a commentary, and there was just some big problem that needed to be fixed, and people weren't doing anything, and he was like, "Just fix it, just fix it." Yeah, it was good, but and that's that's how we think about this, right? If you could just do what you need to do, and then the question is, if somebody isn't, or if somebody can't, or if somebody won't then what do we need to pay attention to? And if anxiety is in there, right, that's a really powerful force, right? Just fricking drive across the bridge. Okay, my job is how do I help you manage the worry when it shows up so it isn't the dominant narrative about this? Because we know with anxiety, it tells you a really good story and it takes you to the worst case scenario. So how do we help you? The place to start really is to have a different conversation with your daughter about this. What is she invested in? And if you've got this whole team around her, if there's a lot of anxious energy around finishing things and getting it done, you know, you said she's in denial. I, I'd be curious, what is she in denial about? If she, is she in denial that she has executive functioning issues? Is she in denial that she has anxiety? Is this, is this all these things that other people have told her about her that she doesn't really buy into, right? That can be a conversation as well. I just wonder where her voice is in this story. So time to listen. And if you have this conversation, mom, if you ask these conversations and your daughter shrugs her shoulders and says, I don't know, you say to her, you know what? Sometimes talking about this is really hard. It feels really uncomfortable. Just write it down for me or write it down for your therapist or talk to your therapist about it. Or let's have a, let's have a conversation in your therapist's office so that we can talk about this together. Family systems are so important. And I know everybody's going to say, oh, here it comes again. Yes, here it comes again, everybody. If you have somebody who you love in therapy, particularly your child, and you are not included in that process, it really makes the work a lot harder. 
it's really, really helpful to have that communication. It's time for a team meeting, right? You know, maybe her anxiety is creating all these catastrophic stories for her. Lots of times when, when we say that people are in denial, there's what they say. Yeah, no, I don't, have a, I don't have a problem. Yeah, no, it's fine with me. And then if you can peel away that and ask, you know, what's really going on inside of you about this? Then you get some important information. There's a lot of fear here. I just feel right. like there's a lot of fear. The mom is really afraid of her of her child failing. It's just there's just a lot of fear. So much of so much of what we deal with, it's it's just being afraid that we're going to screw up as a parent, or being afraid as a teenager that you're not going to live up to expectations, or afraid of what comes next, or afraid of saying the wrong thing. It's just it's just a lot of fear, and it's okay to acknowledge that for sure. I think a meta point, though, that you've said a lot, I just want to repeat for emphasis, though, is we don't want to be afraid of our child's successes or failures and what they say about us, because Mm -hmm. that's egoic parenting. Right. And there aren't a lot of good outcomes there. We have to separate our own egos from our kids' failures and successes, because it's about them and it's not about us. And that is really, really hard to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's easier to say it than it is to feel it. (laughs) Whatever anybody says to me, easier said than done. I'm like, yeah, duh. (laughs) So join the Fluster Clucks Facebook group so you can ask Lynn your question on an upcoming episode. And if you like the podcast, go to Apple and leave a review. It helps our show reach more people. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin.